Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our little Zoom session tonight. How are we all doing? Good, thanks. Well, we good. Got... We must have scared, scared Caitlin Noon away, or maybe she thinks she knows knows everything. <laughs> um, a couple of you haven't been to these before, just so that you know a little bit of housekeeping. I'm recording this one, so anyone who's not able to be here at this particular point in time can can watch the recordings later. We share them on YouTube as an un as an unlinked, sorry, an un um, uh, it's a proper word for it. I can't remember what it is now. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a link which doesn't show up as public, but if you have the link, anyone can watch it. So we do share that to everyone in the squad if they want to watch these recordings. Um, not necessarily a bad idea to try and keep up with what we're uh, what we're trying to teach you all. As a so, if you miss some of it, it's not a disaster because you can always watch it later. Um, as well as being recorded, I do encourage you to speak. Uh, I will pause quite a lot of the time. If I do, it's a prompt for any one of you to launch in and, and ask questions or make points or whatever. I don't want this to be a lecture. The idea is that it's a discussion um, with some guiding points. I did email out the agenda for this uh, this session, which hopefully you've all had a bit of a look at and maybe even a bit of a think about. Um, what I do have is recordings of all of the goals that were scored and some significant parts of the play from the game on Friday night. So we can, we'll go through that and have a look at some of the things that went well and some of the things that we need to improve, which is normal. It's like game two, game three, everyone, there's a lot of improving to do. Uh, at this point, every single game we look at, we think, oh, yeah, there's a lot of things here we can do a lot better uh, because because there is, you're all worrying you. All okay with that? Yep. If you uh, steer it in another direction, now is your time to speak. Oh, we're all good. Okay. Um, again, yeah, we'll do it. feel free to, to interrupt um, um, a lecture. It's a discussion. Um, so, just some notes on the on the game on Friday. What observations do any of you have about how it went? I feel like we had a pretty good first and second period, or at least half of the second period. Um, good things worked. Pressure. Yeah, we can work on pressure. Be more specific. Uh, I think the Hazies did from what like talking to the umpire and stuff afterwards, I think the Hazies did quite well in the interchanges. Yeah, shift changes, yeah. Shift changes are mostly pretty good, which was that one of our goals that we we're trying to achieve for that game? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So what we try and do, just so that you know, and, and I, I do we put it out there fairly regularly. What we try and do is for each game, we introduce two or three new things and then we consolidate on the things that we've done. So progressively through the season, we build on on the basics. And the basics for the first two games is really just getting your shifts, getting you to understand how to change and, and where to stand in defence. Uh, if we get those things by the end of game two or game three pretty much spot on, then that's, that's a really positive outcome. So did we work all right with our shift changes? Yeah, I think our positioning was better as well than in the first game. I would absolutely agree with that. On the whole, it was. There's a lot of stuff we need to work on, but the fundamental basic positioning for your defensive positioning was on the whole pretty good. Uh, there's a few times we got a bit lost. There were some face-offs where we were all over the place, <laughs> but you get that at this stage. Um, it's also interesting to note the correlation between people who do the Zoom sessions and that sort of stuff and the ones who improve better and who know where to stand, there's a, there's a pretty strong connection, um, which seems obvious when you think about it. The more homework you do, the better you are on the ice, which is which is important. Um, so shift lengths on the whole was pretty good. Um, did we have to do any penalty kills? Hmm. Yeah, we did. I think that, well, the hazy seemed like we did an all right job, but the other the, the Mac Daddy's also did good at the uh, box defense. All right, let's have a look at it. So we did. We ended up with four penalty kills, including one where for a little while we might have been four and four, and that's because um, one of the referees pinged Mac Daddy's for a bench penalty, which was a bit strange because he was 
suggesting that we were having the gate door open for too long. Sometimes the referees make interesting decisions, and that was certainly one of them, because um, I, I don't think that, that was an issue at all. But uh, the old story with referees, they decide reality, and we just have to deal with it. So let's have a look at some of the penalty kills. I've got all of them here from the game extracted. I don't know if any of you have a chance to look at the videos of the games, but it is worth doing. Um, you can pick up a lot about how the games went, uh, and you can also analyse your own play. If you can recognise yourself on the ice. The camera angle kind of makes things look a little bit distorted but it does work. So you do get an idea and it's a useful thing to do to um, to just learn more about your game. So here's the first penalty kill. Now, I'm just going to pause this for a second. Are any of you here who were on the MacDaddies who were do involved in that first penalty kill? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was there. Told you during the intermission to go back and get set up in your in your basic defensive positions. Yeah, you told us to told go into to those. Right? Yeah, then the ref was saying go to the face off. He was trying to be helpful. He was not being helpful. <laughs> we had a plan and he then broke yeah, he, he confused everyone <laughs> he was trying to be helpful he knows you're all beginners he thought you had no idea where to go whereas we actually had a very very like we'd been through it we'd drawn it on the whiteboard we knew where we had to be and then Dave proceeded to reorganise us which he shouldn't have done but anyway that happens so we're all kind of skating around here looking a little bit confused and, and understandably so so let's see what happens So we've actually got a centre at the face-off. That's fine. We can set up however we want. It's not up to him. It's our call. <laughs> but no worries. Anyway. What have we got? Second box. Yeah, basic. It's not perfect, but it's, you know, it's a basic box defence. Um, we should probably have whoever that is back here instead of out there at that point in time. But, you know, that's not disastrous. Yeah, that was me. Yep. You're probably puck watching. It's normal. It's an instinct you have to fight. Now, at that point, whoever's wearing number seven, that one there, should be going out to do the challenge. And we do. It's good. We need to set the puck. We get it out. Goes around the back. Now, at this point, though, we have a problem, don't we? Yes. What's gone wrong? Yeah. One side's all open. Yeah. Why, why is one side wide open? Number eight with the uh, boards. When you should oh. probably be more in front of the goals. What are you doing there? <laughs> Get back here. <laughs> right? It's it's important. Uh, and additionally, if I'm not sure who that is, but they've actually got possession of the puck, that's all right. But if they didn't have possession of the puck, they'd be better off here between that player and the net. Again, early days, it's the first time we've done it, but just sort of picking up on those things. But, you know, clear the puck out. That's all right. So, again, this one wants to be over there. Can you see my mouse moving around? Yeah, we can see it. Should be yep. there instead. Okay. And these two D, see how deep they are? Yeah. They want to be up a little bit higher. Ideally, they want to be just below the hash marks, sort of there and there, just like maybe a metre or so higher up. 
That way the goalie gets better vision, can see shots from a distance. You're less likely to screen the goalie. Uh, and you're still owning that space. Okay, because if they come in from here, they've got a bad angle. If they come in from here, they've got a good angle. We're just trying to control angles into the net. Okay. So what happens when they come in with the park is they run into a traffic jam. Now, ultimately, if you think, where do you want to take a shot from? Right in front of the goal. If you can, absolutely. The best place to take a shot from gives the goal less choices. So they run into this traffic jam of people and they can't get the shot away, which is good. Once we all finish falling over because we're all beginners. All right. So what do we have there? He was wide open. Yeah. Loose player in the slot. Most Second most dangerous player is a loose player in the slot. And it's because both of these are down low. We've allowed that space to open up. Okay, that's why it happens. Um, the, the trick in a penalty kill is self-discipline. <laughs> Tricky thought, I know. But we've got to try and make sure that as much as possible, we maintain that structure. And if one person goes to get the puck, no one else goes to help. I know you want to help your teammates. Don't. All right, because that provides opens up a loose player straight in, boom, goal. It was actually a really nice goal there. I think that was um, Amanda Lawless who got that one. Um, yeah, it was Amanda. She was in good position, and it was a good shot. Yeah, Amanda. Right, so you can see it happen here. So we've gone behind the net to challenge for the puck, haven't we? Yeah. As a defensive player, if you go behind the net on a penalty kill, you're taking yourself out of the play. They can't score from there, so they're not dangerous. The idea is to prevent danger. So a player, an attacking player with the puck behind the net is not dangerous. No one's going to pull a Michigan in C2, I promise. <laughs> You all know what a Michigan is? You just watch me, Carl. <laughs> that, sounds like a, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> I hear you. I watch it. Let's see it get done. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's not going to happen. Um, they're not dangerous, so don't go after them. The idea is to prevent the penalty. Sorry, to prevent the goal, not to try and retrieve the puck. It doesn't matter at that point. They've got to come around, and chances are, at this level of hockey, they're going to stuff it up. Um, so you can leave them. Right. So behind the net, gets beaten. Two of you then puck chasing, which frees up Amanda. There's no one on her. She's unmarked in the prime shooting spot. Nice little shot. Here it goes. Something else about Amanda's shot. What sort of shot was it? Wrist shot? Yeah. Anything else? Was it high? Was it low? It's relatively low. Low too, wasn't it? What do you know about goalies? Um, they typically can cover the most area with the, the leg pads if they get dropped down. But so, how fast are your hands? Oh, yeah, faster than legs. Faster your feet. As a general rule, shooting low is usually the better option. Even though they've got pads, quite often, especially in C grade, they can't butterfly properly, which means they can't get their feet right, right out. So they're not wide, so they always leave a bit of a gap. It's usually the five hole. Goalies in C grade, massive five holes, which is between their legs. That's where you'll score most of your goals. Not all of them, but most of them. So that's the first penalty kill. Oops, one window. What am I doing? Let's have a look at this one's going to go for quite, quite a while because this was two penalty kills combined in one. <laughs> so let's just have a look at it and see what happens. All right, who's wearing number 22? What are you doing? <laughs> At the face-off, 22 was a bit lost. I'm not sure who it is. I'm still still getting to know all your names. Really should probably be back here somewhere, not 
essentially offside. The referee should have, shouldn't have played, dropped the puck until he was in the right spot. But anyway, it's trying to be helpful by letting us get away with stuff that we shouldn't get away with. It happens. Just kind of saunter around. What do you think about that penalty kill? It's a very strange box. It is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the puck's just been dropped. It's only a couple of seconds in, but it's probably not really where we should be. Let's let it unfold. Now, luckily, we had one player in the right position. There's this one here. Now we're getting organised. How's that look? That's bang on. Better, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. The D is right where they should be. They're just below the hash marks. The other winger is up sort of halfway between the hash marks and the blue line. That's a pretty good position for a basic box defence. Our other player, I think, is off chasing the puck. Not necessarily a problem at that point in time, or maybe they've even got possession. I don't know. Yeah. Now, the really nice thing there, whoever's wearing number three, I'm not sure who that is, has realised that they don't have the puck, so they've come back to get into possession. This is the end of position is really good. You can clear the puck down the other end. All good. We get a change. Also good. When the puck's dumped down the other end is the time to get your changes, isn't it? That's really nice play. I like that. How's that look? Still pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. I like the setup. It's not all telling you that you do bad stuff. Quite often it's good stuff as well. Good stuff, pressure. Yep. Pressure up high, cutting off that move. D is still in position. Um, that's not too bad. No one wants the puck. Eventually we'll clear it. Belt it up the board, get rid of it, and it's out. And out they all have to go. Hooray. Now, this is where the weird thing happened. At this point, Dave is telling me, or, or telling um, uh, um, Chrissy Dundas's partner, <laughs> that we haven't been closing the gate fast enough. And as a result, Blue gets a bench penalty. A bench penalty is when it's not a specific player who's committed an infraction. It's it's a team offence. And so someone has to go and sit the penalty for two minutes. It doesn't really matter who it is. It doesn't go on their, on their points record or anything. So you don't get pinged for it. It's not, it's just annoying. Um, and so the clock continues to tick down for the hazies, which is killing their penalty for them, which is good. Um, and, and we're like, yeah, what? <laughs> I was trying to work out what he called us for because I honestly didn't understand it. So let's just have a look briefly at how the Mac Daddies have set up on that on that uh, face off. How does that look? It's a nice sort of wall of people. Yeah. Yeah, it's very clumped. Hmm. But, but what what do you think is going to happen there? What are they trying to set up for? The square. Yeah, to get into the box quickly. By already mostly being in position, they don't have to move very far. None of you move particularly quickly at the moment. If you can be close to where you want to be, it's good. See what they actually do when the puck gets dropped. It's not bad when they've got possession. Dump the puck out, try to dump the puck out. There it is. Get it eventually. Yay, there it goes. Puck comes out. Puck comes back in. Puck goes back out. Puck comes back in. <laughs> We're playing table tennis. Where are all the green players? Together? Yeah, that's not ideal, is it? But we'll work on that later. Um, and they've left a lot of space wide open behind them, which is suboptimal. But anyway, we'll work on that. Now, 
the blue defense defensive pattern is not too bad, except they've got one player who's gone right up the other end, and if he gets beaten, he's out of the play. Well, lucky for them, it's an icing. Was making some very strange noises. How's that look? Pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. D is D are up in roughly the right spot. Wingers or whoever the forwards are up in pretty much roughly where they want to be. That's not bad. So what that causes is a shot from a bad angle. So, um, oh, how can I possibly have forgotten his name? Our goalie for blue had plenty of time to see that one coming. It was coming in from a long way away. Jackson. Yeah, Jackson. He had plenty of time to see that, so that wasn't so bad. But then there was a loose, um, hazy, right smack bang in the slot that wasn't there. And that's Lauren. She comes skating in. And she's loose. Anyway, the game continued on from that point. All right. So that's that one. So on the whole... Not bad, certainly for the second game, and in particular, for the first time they've actually done a penalty kill this season, that's pretty good. We've got one more to look at. Screen sharing thing, where did you go? You see the problem there? The the right right winger needs to get in front of that um Hazy's player and uh back daddy player. Get up a bit higher anyway. Maybe not necessarily yeah. in front of them, but but more up here um than down there. Because we've currently got two players. They've got a loose player sitting here, number nine. Thirty-five is also not really covered. So I am not sure who that is. It might be Oh, I'm still terrible with your names. But if if this one was there instead, they've kind of got that one and that one covered. Cutting off the pass and also cutting off the shot to 35. So you can go out to, to Sean and cut him and, and interfere with his shot if he if it gets past him. That's why you set up that square. But we're a bit lucky. Goes in on a bad angle. Now that's better. We didn't chase into the corner. Good. I don't know why this video has decided to lock up on me. It was fine before. All right. So on the whole, we didn't go and chase, but what did happen? They got the puck back. Yeah. Where are all the green players? Bunched up. Yeah. The box has collapsed. This is no longer a box. This is a scrunched up box. It's not so good. All right, which means we've got a loose player floating around here. These other players could potentially move in if they wanted to. There's lots of there's lots of room in dangerous positions for the Mac Daddies to get a shot away. We're a bit lucky that it didn't didn't end up happening. So see where the D are now. So what we should have, that one should be here. That one should probably be here, and that one should be up here. Okay. As soon as you get a chance to get your structure, get your structure back as quickly as you can. And that may be putting pressure on someone. You kind of want to hold it about that spot. No one's going to shoot and score from the point. 
what to think about, isn't it? But if you just think, I'm going to hold a box, then I'm going to clear the puck out of the zone like we did, great. Oh, stay on your feet. Come on. We're still on the penalty, aren't we? Yeah. Box, box. <laughs> That's not a box. <laughs> That's a mess. All right. First game. We're learning it, but we're going to learn it better. They've got a couple of good shots on there. And we're a bit lucky that, that uh, Billy kept them out. Sorry, that's my phone making strange noises. Okay. So um, whoever that is with the pink helmet, we need to get a bit more discipline. We're skating around all over the place like a chicken with a head cut off. Let's see if we can hold our position rather than try and do everything. It's common at this point, is obviously you can skate quite well um, to try and do everything, but the problem is that that then breaks your structure. And we're about playing structure, not about one player trying to do everything. If we play with structure, we're much harder to beat, especially towards the end of the season. Where are you going now? What are you doing there? <laughs> it's not a box. <laughs> All right. So it's on everyone's responsibility when you're playing a penalty kill to remind each other. We've got a hive mind, if you like. There's In a penalty kill, there's four of you plus the goalie on the ice. At least one of you knows what should be happening. So remind each other. Box, get in this position. Be assertive and speak up. We talk about communication in a vague sort of sense of everyone wants to be communicating, and that's great. But we actually need specifics. When it's a penalty kill, make sure everyone on the ice knows that it's a penalty kill and knows where they should be. And if you know and someone's out of position, tell them. Okay? Speak up. Speak your mind. Make sense? Yep. yep. We'll all help each other. It comes it comes even more important later on when we start talking about defensive zone face-offs, which is a few games in from now when you really have to remind each other because you're going to forget lots. But that, that box broke down quite badly. It's also the end of the game. We've got like five seconds to go. Everyone's tired. Anyway, that's our penalty kills. So for the first penalty kill that we've actually done as, as teams, for both teams, I think they're pretty good. There's a lot we can do better, but it's a good start. Okay, if you have a look at the other teams doing their penalty kills, they're nothing like as structured as that. Even the teams that have been around and are into their second season, like, for example, the um, the Rock Hoppers and the Big Deals, both of whom have mostly followed through from the previous season. Those, those players have all got about 12 games in them by now, whereas you guys have two. Um, so that 12 games makes a big difference. Their penalty kill structure is still pretty vague. Um, ours, by the end of the season, will be a lot more structured. Uh, it will whip you into shape. All right, so that's the penalty kills. I'm not going to worry too much about power plays. We did had, have some. But if you had to make an observation about a power play, what would it be? Power play is when you've got the advantage, the other team is on the penalty. I think the um, awareness of actually being on a power play is still pretty low. Like yep. there was still a lot of puck dumping <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that instead of maybe carrying into the ozone and actually setting up. Yes. Absolutely. What, why is that, do you think? Because it's been two games. <laughs> <laughs> we're still new to this right and if you jump on the ice and you're still at that at that stage where you jump on the ice and all of a sudden there's this massive jolt of adrenaline and it's like oh stuff's happening what do i do <laughs> and yeah you get confused um that's why people who would watch a game of hockey and everyone's watched hockey and should roughly know where to stand in a face-off jumps on and looks lost and ends up skating around vaguely in the wrong direction wondering where they should be 
um, it, it's a, it's a, just a stress and an, an adrenaline thing. Um, so yeah, panicking more so than anything else. I think you're spot on. It's that awareness of the fact that you're on a power play is is um, is quite significant because when you're on a power play, you can usually take the time. There's no great rush. Um, you want to keep possession, At the very least, keep possession of the puck, and ideally turn it into some shots. We will be practicing how to attack. Penalty kills and power plays at our training sessions. We will actually put some time pressure on you and go through it a bit. Uh, obviously, we haven't done it yet because we didn't have time in the first session and there's too much. But it will be a feature of probably the second or definitely the third training session. We'll be working on attacking penalty kills. Um, and that's it's quite good fun. Um, how about our defensive positioning on the whole? So going back to... Uh, I think it wasn't too bad. Yeah, it was all right, wasn't it? Um, let's have a look at some of the goals. All right, who's that doing the tea stop? <laughs> I don't know who it is, but we're going to fix that. Number 20, is that 13? 13 green, do I know who that is? I think it could be Pam, maybe. No, it's Drew, I'm very sure. See this? No. <laughs> learn to stop properly. Get to public sessions, learn how to stop. It makes a difference. That doesn't work. It works on rollerblades but it doesn't work on ice. It really doesn't work on ice and it's unstable and you're likely to trip yourself over. So, yeah, uh, don't do it. Learn to stop. See how unstable it is? Uh-oh. That shot's pretty well screened still. Yeah, but... Where's everyone looking? Back towards the slot, like no one's looking at the open player. Yeah, they're all looking at the puck, aren't they? So as Caitlin skates in here down to the middle of the slot, totally unmarked, no one's even aware of the fact that she's there because they're all busy watching this. No one's turned their head around to say, hey, what's happening behind me? You have to have your radar switched on. The hockey, hockey jargon for that is having your head on a swivel. Yeah, you can call it that if you like. Everyone's head's on a swivel anyway. Um, but having your radar switched on so you know what's going on around you. Because watch what happens with Caitlin. Oh, Katie, should have been a goal. <laughs> right, unmarked. The responsibility for marking that is one of these two. Probably whoever's playing centre there. Is that you, I think, um, uh, Amanda? I think that might be you there. I can't actually see, so it might be. I'm just listening. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well, it might be. I don't think so. She had the rainbow socks on. That might be Lauren. Or... Yeah. No, I don't think it's Lauren. Anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter who it is. But well, the point is that, that that player who is probably a centre has not picked up on Caitlin's existence. And as a result, Caitlin gets a chance for a goal and, and a really good one. Uh, and that's just that picking up on that player. And at that point, Caitlin should have someone in her face, like literally standing on her toes. But there isn't, so she gets a good shot. Doesn't go in, but they get the rebound. Now, good thing here, I'm really pleased with that. Uh, whoever that is in the White Sox has come back up into their position instead of chasing behind the net, and that's good. That's good play. Our other D has gone in, also good. Our centre has worked out what's going on. It's still not quite covering up on Caitlin, but that's okay. We have the luxury of being able to slow it down. We're doing it in real time. Right, so that's not bad cover. Um, D in the right spot. This forward over here for the blue isn't particularly dangerous at that point in time, but we're still probably not aware of their existence. So we need to be making sure that we know what's going on. This winger should be not there, should be there. Okay, 
that winger's job is to defend this player. Okay, make sense? This is the part where you say, yes, I understand. <laughs> yes, I understand. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> right, that's their job, not to be over here. Why do you think that's the case? Because if you're all ganged up on the strong side, yep. then you leave the back behind you all open. And if they get the puck through, yep. it's game over. That, that's a big part of it. What's the other part of it? Because you're right, but there's more to it. Right. Uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say for potential, if he gets possession for a breakaway to try and odd man rush him. Exactly. So what we want to do is if that winger is here, if we get the possession from this puck battle, that winger is going to do this. It becomes a good passing option and, a, and an outlet, and we get a chance to counterattack. If, on the other hand, they're down here, can we counterattack? Nope. No. You've got nothing. The D's got no one really to pass to, um, and the winger is, is, is no longer really a passing option for that escape. So we can't get out. So even if we get possession, pretty much all we can do is dump the puck down the other end and run the clock down a little bit. It's not ideal. So winger's positioning is out there. This one here should also be up here. I can't see where the other forward is, which should also be up a little bit higher. Just getting out of there. Let the D do their jobs. It's really important. We've got to trust our defence. Let them do their job. Now, at that point... Lily would probably like that one back because she probably should have saved that. It wasn't from a particularly good angle um, and it was a shot under pressure. So I'm not particularly worried about that one as a goal. Um, but look at where Caitlin is again. You see the problem? She's wide open. She's wide open again, yeah. So that's Herbis Centre here. That's got rainbow socks on. I think that might be you. Um, Amanda? That's Amanda. Right. Yeah. Your job in that situation, I know you can't see, but you'll be able to watch this later, uh, is to turn around and get in Caitlin's face. Lift her stick up off the ice, be annoying. Take the option away, or at the very least, be aware of her existence and cut off the pass. So have your stick down, cutting off a pass to her. That's that's a key, a key requirement there. Because if that hadn't have gone in and had it bounced off a pad and come to here, Katie would have been, woohoo, first goal. Because <laughs> she hasn't scored a goal yet, and she'd love to. Okay, so it's just some examples of those sorts of defensive positioning that we need to keep working on. But on the whole, it's not bad, certainly for this stage of where we are, but there's lots that we can improve. All right. Um, did we follow up on rebounds? It's not that I recall. Um, we did a little bit. Yeah, I'm not too sure. What, what does that really mean? Like when there's a shot to follow it in, yeah. as like other players follow it in, I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Chase it into the net. Because every now and then the puck bobbles out into a nice spot and you get a shot. It's fairly unusual that it pops out somewhere nice for you to just tap in and put it away. But if you're not there, it certainly won't. And you get a lot of rebounds. One of the big differences between goalies in C grade and goalies as they get better is not so much how well they stop the first shot, but where they put the rebound. A good goalie, an experienced goalie, will either freeze the puck or, or like catch it or, or stop it from moving or put it into the corners. In both cases, you can't score from there. A less experienced goalie will often pop a rebound directly in front of the net, which is... Exactly where you want it. <laughs> where an attacking player wants to pick it up and put it in the net. Um, so yeah, crash the net and I'll give you an example of why it's important to, to be in that crashing the net position um, just give me a second, I'll pull up the right video I apologise, if you're not a fan of the Bruins I apologise because pretty much everything, I, all the videos I use as examples are from Bruins games because they're the ones that I watch watch what happens here now this isn't a crashing, this, this isn't a rebound all right, this is a defensive failure on the part of oh oh the Leafs. Did the Leafs stuff up? What a shame. Anyway, it's... <laughs> mm. 
We'll just watch that one in slow motion. It's quite good. Who's marking? Who's marking Bergy? Look where he is. Unmarked in front of the slot. Right in front of the goalie. He's not in the crease, but he's in the perfect position. Is that the pretty easiest... much where Caitlin was? Yeah. Is that the easiest goal he's ever scored? Maybe, but be one of be one of them. <laughs> All he had to do is have his stick on the ice. He just tipped it in. It was like he didn't do anything. Look at how much his stick moves. Watch his stick and see how much it moves. <laughs> just in place, yeah. So if you're loose in the slot, you're dangerous. Don't let someone get loose there. What they should have done is gone and lifted his stick up off the ice. That solves that problem. Um, okay, so I'm going to go over now. We're going to move across to um, a little bit more work on changes, which we're going to go through. And then we're going to talk about um, our pressure game. So our one two two four check. Uh, and we've already touched briefly on wing wingers where they should be on the breakout, but we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time looking at that as well. Um, so the first thing is, so far for the first two games, our emphasis has really been on what? So line changes and the box defence. Yeah, well, a little bit on the box defence, but what's been our real... Our, 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 the one is changes and the other one is just defensive structure. Yeah. At least I hope that's what's got through to you because that's what we're trying to teach. <laughs> Hopefully I'm getting the message yeah. across. Um, so we've pretty much just said change in less than a minute, yeah? Without any real, any more detail than that. Is that a problem? Yeah. Why? No one has an idea why changing every 45 seconds is a problem. Come on, someone will guess. Have a go. Um, because it allows you to it allows you to go for a longer like a short period of time really quickly and then you have a break. Yes, but why is it also potentially a problem? Because it might put you out of a good position that you were potentially in or could have been in by switching to someone. Yeah, be more specific. Because you're both right. Think it's specific Let me put it to you like this. What happens if the opposition has the puck and is charging towards your net? Is that a good time to get a change? No. No, it's not, is it? No. Even if you've been on for 45 seconds or a, or a minute and a half, if we are under defensive pressure, it's generally a bad time to get the change. Because? Uh, is that why... Is that why some players, like in the NHL, stay on for like two minutes? That's a pretty during long... like a defensive rush. You're stuck stuck in defense, and you can't get out. Then absolutely yes, because you're stuck. You have to defend, right? If you're a center or if you're a D, getting a change when the other team's coming is a bad idea. Um... Because it takes time for that change to occur. Absolutely. Um... And so it takes a lot longer for the other player to step into yeah. the other player's shoes. Matt, that makes sense. Yeah, to get into position because it's a defensive structure that's important. Uh, uh, if a well-organised defence, so everyone basically standing still where they should be, is actually pretty hard to score against. When we do penalty kills and power plays later on at training, we're going to put out four witches hats and we're going to get you to attack four witches hats and see just how effective they are. So if you're just in position, that's great. But if you're stuck doing a change and at the moment your changes are pretty slow it's a while to get over the bench it's a while to get back again there's 10 seconds that's an opportunity for your opposition to get an un, un, unopposed goal or an odd player rush against you which is which is terrible <laughs> so given that when's a good time to change when we're offense yeah and from one end of the um rink to the other 
that the idea is is the change is more important than the rush almost without exception i'm just going to try and find a video this is a really good one of this i've got it somewhere i haven't put it in a useful place which isn't very useful so i apologize it's the charlie coil one Yes, I'm just trying to track down. There's a particular video, which is very good. Let me go to face lock. It's not trying all defensive positions. So I've got to keep pinching. Sorry about this while well, I just try and find... Right. Anyway, I've got a video of Charlie Coyle jumping on the ice and within about five seconds he scores a goal. And the idea behind that, the, the key to it is, is that you change when there's a rush on so that you can get fresh legs on. And there's two really important reasons for that. One of them we've already mentioned, which is that you don't want to change when you're defending because you're abandoning your post. What's the other reason? It's just the fresh legs thing. Yeah, fresh legs. Why is fresh legs important? I think um, it's pretty well documented that players' skills fall off a cliff after, a, you know, not a very long period of time because it's quite intensive playing hockey. Anything else? Because you're right, but is there anything else? Uh, you reckon those players that were on the attack that are now have to defend would be pretty tired because they no, we, haven't changed. Absolutely. You haven't got fresh legs to get back, have you? You've sprinted up. No. Being part of an attack, great. You're going to try and score a goal. You use a lot of energy doing that. And then they get possession and they're belting down the other end. And have you got the gas to get back there and then defend? And what happens if you're stuck in defence for two minutes? Uh, you'll be gassed. <laughs> exactly. You end energy up mismatch. Or possibly, possibly worse, which is that you might fall over or something else and even possibly hurt yourself, which we certainly don't want. Um, so the, the key really is to um, change on the rush. And I know it sounds like you're missing out on an attacking opportunity, but a little bit of maths for you. It takes roughly between 10 and 20 attacking opportunities to score a goal in general, across pretty much all grades of hockey. So if you lose one attacking opportunity, is that a disaster? No. Not really. Mathematically, it's bugger all. It's like 5%. If you give away an easy goal, is that a disaster? Yeah. It would take 20 yeah. attempts to get it back. You need 10 or 20 opportunities to get that goal back, which is why defence is so much more important. If you miss out on an opportunity to score, okay, it's disappointing. You might have got a goal, but you probably wouldn't have. Doesn't mean you don't want to try to, because, of course, we'll try and score goals. It's, it's a fun part of the game. But our priority has to be to stop scoring, which means we change on the rush. One player goes barreling off with the puck. They can keep going. If you're right up and involved in it close, maybe, depending on how fresh you are, like if you've only just come on, stay on. But if you've been on for... 45 seconds in a defensive press and been working, that's a good time to change. Um, fresh legs score goals. So be ready for those changes as well. Really important. So what we want to see both teams doing from now on is trying to change on the rush rather than rather than defence. There are exceptions to that. Um, if you're totally nailed and you can't stand up anymore, get a change anyway, because you know even it's, it's sometimes worth doing. And the other exception is if you are the player carrying the puck or if you've only just got on, then you can participate in a rush and try and score a goal, maybe you're a passing option or whatever. So I'm not saying don't ever do it, but we need to start thinking about appropriate times for changes rather than just changing. Why do you think we've taught you this way, though? Yeah, you know, that sort of fear of consequences of getting exhausted and messing stuff up. Yeah, partially. What else? You're right.
Anything else? We're trying to form a habit. So if you have a good habit to start with, it's going to work better. It's essentially the gist of it. Okay, so the reason why we teach you to change on the like straight away within sort of 45 seconds to start with is just because we want to establish that habit in the back of the head from the very first time you get on the rink, you're thinking about when you're getting off. Okay, and that's it's absolutely critical. What will tend to happen um, as at the moment, as soon as you jump on the ice, you get this huge jolt of adrenaline. That, that in itself is fatiguing. So you get tired pretty much without even skating around at all. And you're not, none of you at the moment have have the skill to be able to work hard enough to really get tired. It's just a, you haven't got the skill yet. For that. You'll come, but you haven't got it yet. Uh, you think you're tired, but it's, it's mostly an, an adrenaline rush. About halfway through the season, though, that adrenaline rush starts to get a little bit less. And so you jump out on the ice and you don't feel tired or not as tired. So you think you can go for longer. In fact, you shouldn't go for longer. You should go harder. So rather than play longer shifts, you play faster shifts. And then you're more dangerous because the faster players are more effective as a general rule. If you're quicker, you get to the puck faster. You shut down breakaways faster. You back check quicker. You have more opportunity to score goals because you're quicker. It doesn't mean you're doing longer shifts at the same pace. It means you're doing shorter shifts at a higher pace. And for a lot of people coming from other sports, that's a really big cognitive shift. You really got to, like, it's not what you're used to, but that's that's how it works. If you played Aussie rules, if you played soccer, if you played netball, if you played basketball, all of those sports, they're all relatively slow in terms of how, how quickly you change and the intensity of the time that you're on. Um, we play at a sprint, and that's that's one of the unique things about ice hockey is that it is so fast. Um, and you'll notice through the levels, the biggest difference is they're just quicker. There's a lot of individual skill that's better, but on the, as a general rule, they're just generally quicker. Make sense? Yep. We'll continue to work on it. We'll, this, is a, this will be a, um, a revision point and a building one point every single game through the season. It's always short shifts, short shifts, short shifts. You'll get sick of me saying, <laughs> apologize, suck it up. You've got to deal with it because your shifts will start to get long. You won't realize that it's happening, but but it will happen, I guarantee it. Uh, and so we will continue to hammer away on that and try and keep your shifts as short as we possibly can. Um, and that's just the nature of it. All right. So um, changes on the rush, not in defense. Um Understanding the forecheck, a one, two, two, four check. Anyone want to try and describe a one, two, two, four check for me? I'm going to pop up a rink diagram. And you all have the ability to annotate this. At least you will have in a sec when I share it. So are you used are any of you used to using the annotator with Zoom? No. no. Oh, come on. We did two years of lockdown. <laughs> Surely someone knows how to do it. Um, be all right if I could find the annotator. All right. So there's our ring. Say we're, we're going from bottom to top. All right. And they have the puck there. One of their players has gone back to get it. Any one of you that knows how to drive the annotator should be able to mark this up, and I want you to draw for me as best you can what a one two two four check looks like on that on that position. And try and describe it for me as well, as well, Layton. So the uh, the player here, oops. Here sort of tries to cut them off. Mm -hmm. oh, there should be maybe another one here. They try to stop them from uh, going up. This one sort of 
puts a bit more pressure on them. This one to try and force them to do a shitty dribbler. This is one to sort of catch it, and this one to kind of add more pressure. Where should the D be? D should probably be here ish. Yeah, at this point, they probably wouldn't move up quite that far, but maybe because remember, the opposition's got possession. If they get past us and our D are up on the blue line, have we got a problem? Yeah. So we want our D to be back a little bit high. At the NHL level, absolutely, they should move out that high. But our D aren't that quick. One modification I'd make to that, see how you've got this player coming in in that direction. Instead, you want to come in, take the boards away, and then angle towards them like that. Why do we want to do that? You mentioned yourself one of the reasons that we're trying to do this setup. Our forces him. Oh, you go. I'll go. Our forces him to do the shitty dribbler. Yeah, well, it doesn't force them, but it certainly encourages them to do so. Okay, because effectively what you've done there is this player. I'm going to change colours so you can kind of see what I'm doing. This player looks up the ice, and if you're skating along here. That player sees you coming along the boards. They're not going to play up the boards, are they? Probably not anyway. Instead, they're much more likely to do that. Here's our shitty dribbler, at which point our other two forwards who are there and there can pick it up and get a shot. And our D floating around back here, ready to clean up the mess if something goes wrong. I'll show you an example of it in, in, in action. It's not the best video of it, but it does tell the story. You'll see why it's so effective. This is some of you might have already seen this. It was in last year's grand final. So I should have that. Rules and safety. Find that tutorials and tactics. It's the one. Go. Apologize if you've seen this one already. This is an example. All right. So this is a classic breakout, yeah? There, D. Has the puck. You can't see it, although there's a foot here. This player here is about to do that. Mick is in the right position. Our other winger should probably move across to there, but we'll worry about that a little bit later. It's not perfect. All right, so there's the four check. See number 12 there going in. Taking the boards away. Not perfectly, but a pretty good job of taking the boards away. Where's all their D now? In the centre. I can't see them. Where? Yeah, the offensive players are in front of the D. Yeah, I see no D. <laughs> They've got a defensive player with a puck and no one else anywhere near. No one is protecting... This bit of ice, are they? There's no one there. They'd better win this puck, hadn't they? If this was our breakup, who should be defending that bit, little bit of position? Who plays centre here? I do. Mm, what's your job? Defend that bit of ice there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the centre should be doing this, skating down and looping around in this area. That's the centre's job, to fix that up. Because watch what happens. Really? <laughs> in a grand final? <laughs> he played like nine games and he's still doing that. Anyway, so their D was nowhere to be found. Their other D was nowhere to be found and their centre was way out of position. And additionally, their winger, this one here, was encouraging the cross-ice pass by being out of position. It's why it's so important. I will show you another example of it. Uh, 
All right. Now, this is this is just a shitty dribbler. This isn't so much the one, two, two, but it's an example of why it matters so much. And this time, the bad guy is me. See what's happening? Whee! Oops. They get a shot. We're a bit lucky to get away with that. I want you to pay attention to what number 22 is doing. Which way is number 22 going? What do you mean, which way? Which way is he going? Which way is he traveling? Let's watch again. Watch 22. Backwards. Yeah, but where? Which way? Towards the player or away from the player? What do we teach our wingers to do? On a breakout. Go, go towards the center. Towards and then up, yeah? Yeah. Not away. Because when they go away... As a defensive player, you look up and you see one of your players with your jersey on moving. What are you going to do? Pass to them. Yeah, pass to them. Of course you are. That's I saw. I saw bloody Stav. He was moving away from me. Oh, Stav's moving quick. I've got someone to pass to. Pass. <laughs> right. But he's going the wrong way. Gets picked, and we're pretty damn lucky not to get a goal scored against us. Yeah. All right. So that's me being the bad guy. But that's one of the reasons why what the wingers do is so important. But they are, what they were doing was it was a forecheck on us, which put pressure on us. And took our options away. So the one, two, two, four check. One player goes in, takes the takes the boards away if you can. If you just skate straight towards the opposition, that's okay. But it's better if you take the boards away. The other two forwards come up come up a little bit not as high, waiting for that dribbler to try and pick it off. And the two D sit back, waiting for if they do successfully clear it out. One, two, two. That's why it's called a one, two, two. We're going to work on that all season as well. If we get it right towards the end of the season, that's good. At this point, I just want to introduce the idea to you so that as we as later on through the season, we'll start to get better at it. I don't expect you to get it yet, but at least at least we've thought about it. And we know why it's important. We're trying to encourage that stupid pass across the ice. Wingers, lateral movement, moving from side to side. I think we've touched on that a bit already throughout this session. Um, if you're playing wing, hopefully you remember. Just put the diagram up again. So again, we're attacking the top of the net. Okay, so if they've if if we've got the puck, sorry, if they've got the puck and they're there, our winger should be here. And sorry, hang on, I get that right. I'm gonna do it. They've got the puck. Our wingers should be there and there. Hang on, I'm an idiot. Sorry, let me re reset that. I can totally stop this up. If we're breaking the puck out, sorry, that's what we should have been doing. So we've got the puck. My apologies. So I'll make us blue because why not? We've got the puck back here somewhere. The winger on this side should have their backside on the boards there. The winger on the other side should be doing this. The centre should be in. And looping around there, and the other D should be there. And this D, this D, when they get the puck, he's probably going to pass to that winger, or maybe pass to that winger on the move. Either one is okay. Or possibly pass to the centre. You've got all these options. If this area here is congested, what can that D do? Uh, hit it around. Do we have a that? If the wing is fast, maybe. I don't know. By the way, yeah. do we have a name for that? Uh, I'm not sure. Over. You yell out over. Over means over behind the net. Over to the other side behind the net. It's an abbreviation for that. If you're playing it up the ice, what do you call it? Uh, up. Up, exactly. It's not, these are not trick questions. I'm not trying to fool you. The idea is a simple, consistent terminology. If the D is going to play it up the boards on that side, 
or up through this section, you just yell out up. If you want them to play it, because they might they might have to go in and dig a puck out under pressure. If they need to play it around the other side, you're going to yell out over. And then they should rim it around the boards and the puck should come out this way instead. So up and over. Wingers understand that. The wingers here and doing this, and the puck moves across to the other side. This winger should get the backside back over here. And that winger then does this. We're just switching from side to side. Okay. If the wingers are defending, so say for example, they've got the puck and we're now defending, you will usually find that they will have a player here and here. Sorry, up on the blue line, my mistake. This thing is terrible at drawing stuff. They'll usually have a player there and a player there. The wingers' jobs is to be here and here between that player and the net, but about four or five metres away, not right in their face. Okay. Important. Wingers, if you get caught down here, you're just creating congestion, traffic, screens, all sorts of stuff we don't want. They've now got a loose player up here who can get a shot. And okay, at the moment, probably not too many D have got decent shots on them, but some of the guys from the big deals can shoot from there, and they will. And they've got good shots. But they need to make sure they don't get shots that are under pressure. Okay? A lot to think about, isn't it? Yeah. We've covered D looping to the strong side. We've covered, covered the looping, centers looping to the strong side on the breakout, covering the mistakes. We've gone through that already. Um, the only other thing I really want you to start thinking about now, because we've gone on for quite a while, it's 10 past nine, I do apologise. Um, things that you can be practising your, on your own, if you go to a public session, for example, what sort of things do you think you should do? Practice okay. skating, stop. Yeah. yeah, stopping. I guess changing direction. Yeah, yeah. But also skating with control. There's a couple of you, of you who, who are, I would say, probably over skating your ability to skate. Um, and as a result, you're a bit dangerous. Um, so you want to just make sure that you're skating with control. If you, uh, we we're always going to yell, you know, go faster and more pressure and that sort of stuff. But the reality is we're playing for fun and we don't, we don't want anyone to get hurt. So if you're skating so quickly that you can't control what you're doing, you're skating too quickly. We can all do it. Um, but, you know, don't be a reckless cannibal. Try and work on your control as well. Um, work on crossover starts. Um, work on stopping. If you can skate around with a friend and they just randomly tell you to stop, you know, that's pretty handy. Work on stopping on both sides with a proper hockey stop. Um, if you're not sure how to do it, um, this is not the time to learn it, but there are um, hockey school which will teach you um, and skate school will teach you how to stop. Or if not, if you can't make it to any of them, let me know. And like we do, we go to public sessions on the weekends at ISHQ sometimes uh, and we can make some time to get together with you and work on those skills as well. Um, so that's particularly value. Jane in particular is good at teaching that sort of stuff. Uh, she teaches at, at skate school. Um, keep your knees bent, keep your head up, all those things that seem obvious after a while. Uh, if you're going to stick and pucks, some stuff to work on is passing to each other while you're moving. So pair up with someone else, just practice skating around the rink, passing to each other. Uh, it's really valuable because that's what you do in a game. You don't pass to static things, you pass to people who are moving and you receive passes while you're moving. Just get better at that. That makes a huge difference. Um, Try and practice working on one-timers, so getting a pass and shooting quickly uh, and work on your shot and pass technique. Um, and again, it's, I can't really explain that here. You need to sort of see that in the flesh for it to work. Um, you'll see that at hockey school, which starts up, I think, not this coming week, but the week after on Wednesday nights. Uh, so if you can make it for that, that's pretty handy too. Uh, we do have a training session on Saturday the 28th in the evening, and we'll be working on more of this positional stuff. Uh, and I think we've got one game before then, which is coming up on this Friday. So it's the Saturday after the Friday. If I've got my dates right. Okay. That'll do it for today. I've thrown way too much at you. <laughs> but there is an agenda which you're all emailed at, which you'll hopefully be able to use as a bit of a memory jog. Plus, this session is recorded, so you can have a bit of a look through it. If you have any follow-up questions or anything like that, and I encourage you, please, to have some. Please do get in touch with me. Ask questions on the Facebook group. 
uh, and I will do my best to come up with video examples of, of what I mean, because sometimes it's difficult just to try and explain things and wave your hands around, um, whereas a video can be a lot more useful to explain those sorts of gameplay things. All righty. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'll record this, and um, I have recorded, sorry, and I'll email out the link through to everyone again as well. So, Amanda, I think we're going through some defensive positioning after this. Do you want to hang around? Or are you out of time? I know it's, I know it's late. Yes, no, all good. I'm good to stick around. Say again, sorry? Yeah, all good. Okay, no worries. Have you got video now? I'm no longer driving. <laughs> So you've got video, sweet, okay. So um, Amanda and I are gonna do some stuff just on some defensive positioning because she's gonna be playing D this weekend. Uh, if any of the rest of you wanna listen in or, or, or be part of that as well, you're welcome to. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about distance management and like that, um, but it's it's fairly D specific. Um, so I'm gonna shut down the recording now and then start another recording. I'll stay for that. I mean, I should probably use some more D advice. No I fucked up a fair bit. <laughs> Made mistakes, but you learn from them. That's why you're here. No one expects anyone to be perfect. This is the whole process of learning. Um, so I should 